In your letter, you request. First, Mr. Let me join my colleagues in congratulating you uh, not only on your statement, but also what is indicated by your statement and what I've heard before of your personal participation and effort on behalf of your fellow citizens and the Thank state. You. I think it's not only an example that, of which uh, Mississippi can be proud, but uh, really all the rest of the country. The effort that you've made and the effort that your colleagues have made to, in order to help those who are less fortunate. Thank you. I want to compliment you on that. And also, I think that it should be understood as we ask you questions that uh, we uh, represent all of us areas in which there might be different problems, but we all have problems. And we don't come yes. to this state of Mississippi to criticize, but really to learn more about what you're doing. And uh, we're going to go into each one of our own states where we'll find uh, that uh, there are tremendous difficulties and that we haven't been entirely successful or our people haven't been successful. But I think all of us working together and exchanging knowledge and information, perhaps out of that, as the chairman has pointed out on a number of occasions, out of that will come a better poverty program, which is what, yes. after all, we're all interested in. Uh, I think there have been... I was interested in your discussion about the training of uh, uh, individuals who uh, have lacked literacy in the past and uh, who have uh, lacked a proper education. We've had these manpower training programs across the United States. I'm interested in whether you feel that they're successful and effective. I saw your figure that uh, you had referred to some 6,000 people to the Mississippi State Employment agency, was that it? Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us out of that 6,000 or approximately 6,000, how many of those are actually employed at the present time? No, no, sir, I couldn't. Actually, you're going to have someone here from the Employment Security Commission, and I think that he could give you more information on that. Let me say this about the STAR program. Uh, it is a program that originally in its conception was pointed more educational wise than it was job wise. Uh, we are changing that emphasis somewhat. Uh, but by its, uh, the, the contract, uh, you do have a difficult time from the job angle in that we have to 
take persons, but adults between the ages of 18 and uh, 60. And you have to take the heads of households, which means that this is generally the older person that is unemployed and a head of a household. Uh, second, uh, in our uh, present society, uh, it, particularly in the Negro society in the South, uh, the too frequently the the, uh, the 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 lady of the house is the uh, person who is the head of the house. In other words, uh, it's a female. Uh, matriarchal society, you might say. Uh, therefore... Uh, would you say that there was significance then in the figure of, of 6,000 that have been referred to the Mississippi uh, Employment Agency? I, I don't know what the, what, how many they have been able to place. Right. I would say it's significant that, uh, that, that... To, because I think that there are, not only here in Mississippi, but uh, again elsewhere around the country, there's a question whether our manpower development training programs that are run either at the state level or run by federal funds are uh, uh, effective and uh, whether they actually place the individuals who are who spend a good well, time well the, the, the manpower training programs start at approximately a ninth grade level. Uh, we've got to bring a good many up pretty far yes. to be able to get them into that and the fact that we've gotten as many in as we have I think has been uh, uh, significant. Uh, uh, let, let, let me say this. I would think that if, which is on this point and also on your point, the last point that you make in your statement, and I'd like to have your comment on it, which is uh, if we look back over the period of the last several decades, I would think that you would agree that a number of the programs that have been passed by the federal government in which the states have participated have been effective and, uh, but not entirely successful. Part of the reason that they have not been successful is uh, kind of paternalism that has existed, the direction from Washington and the direction from the state capital to tell people this is what's good for you. This is the kind of program that would be helpful to you. And then having there some, a, either, again, a person from Washington or a person from the state capital or a person from outside the county or outside the community come in and tell the people in the local community this is what you need in order to make the kind of progress uh, we in the rest of the state or we in the rest of the country would like to see you make. To try to get away from that was this, this idea of community participation, so that people would have the responsibility for their own program, that they develop their own program, that they would sit down and examine and analyze what the problem was, and then they would develop a program and perhaps the state or the local government, uh, the state, and the federal government coming in and helping to fund it. That really was the philosophy behind the poverty program. It hasn't been always effective or always successful, whether here in Mississippi or, or elsewhere. But as, uh, as we've heard testimony and, and traveled around the country, where we found effective and successful programs, it's where the people in the locality feel that they have the responsibility. It hasn't, uh, the Manpower Development Training Act has been unsuccessful, where you just come in and have it funded with federal funds and the people of the locality can come or stay or, or leave as they see fit, but if some of their own funds from that local community are also involved, they feel that they have a much greater uh, 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 they feel that they are much more involved, yes. and therefore the issue of whether it's going to be successful or not is much more important to them.
But the whole thing amounted to this, according even to the OEO auditors, over $500,000 for that year could not be accounted for. And it has never been accounted for, according to any standards. It might have been excused here lately, but it's not been accounted for. I abandoned, when, when they admitted that much, I stopped using figures I had, which was high, because I just took their proof and went before the Appropriations Committee, and that's when we got a limitation in the rush of things there. You couldn't get legislation. We got this limitation on the appropriation bill, to which I've referred. I, I might just say to the senator from Mississippi, as we were talking about figures of 500,000 and 650,000, and I again don't have any independent information in connection with this, but the report that was ultimately made, which was the audited financial statements and other financial information, January 31st, 1967, says it is the, uh, by Ernst and Ernst, uh, it says it is the opinion of the grantee, its counsel, and its independent accountants that the amount, if any, ultimately disallowed by the Office of Economic Opportunity after a proper consideration and evaluation of all factors pertaining to expenditures made by the grantee or its delegate agency under this grant will be relatively minor in amount. strict requirements of fiscal control and accounting with a permanent statutory prohibition against the refunding or letting more money be granted to a grantee that has properly, that has failed to properly account for all previous grants made. Now that might seem rather obvious. We had this matter up in the Appropriations Committee, and I offered an amendment to that effect, but it had to be put in the language of a limitation on the appropriation bill. It was accepted by the Senate. I followed it to the conference where it was accepted there, but of course it expired with that appropriation bill, and I'll refer to that amendment having come into operation in a few minutes. Second, I want to recommend strongly that the bill you are writing provide wide and full authority for a governor, any governor of a state, to veto without recourse any project he determines that's not in the public interest. It goes without saying that a governor, anyone elected governor of a state, none of those responsibilities is a responsible man, fills his role to the very best of his ability, and you're not granting to an unknown authority when you put this in the law. It was in the law at one time. It was voted out uh, recently, and I, as I recall, just by one vote margin in the House. I believe that was the vote. The third recommendation I have is that you place the control and administration of the program, and I'm referring now particularly to these uh, Head Start programs, or any local program, community action program, place the control and administration of the program in the hands of local responsible citizens and the constituted governmental authority. Now, gentlemen, under the present law, it's possible for the director, any director, to overrule a governor of a state, overrule a legislature of a state, overrule the county board of control, ignore or overrule the two United States senators, overrule all or part of the congressional delegation. He does not have to clear with anyone in Washington with any of these programs except the busiest man in the world, and that's the President of the United States. And with this world of fire and war and problems at home of the greatest magnitude, the President has no chance in the world 
to be giving his attention to community action projects and shouldn't be. I think that this is a small tiger or a small giant now, but if we do not reverse this trend in 10 years, this very so-called anti-poverty law can develop into a monster that will defy and devour us all, including the old established regular agencies of our federal government. That is the trend now. As I say, we had the recognition of a governor to be recognized in this matter. But we took that out of the law, even though it hadn't been abused, there had been only two absolute vetoes, but the influence of a possible veto was a powerful factor. And when I make references here to the director, I'm not talking about Mr. Shriver alone, when I get to matters pertaining to him, I'll, I'll call his name freely. But any director, any director, if that's going to be the permanent policy of the federal government and then vote into their hands billions of dollars to do as they see fit, subject only to the control of this busiest man in the world, as I say, then that can become the monster that will really devour the people. I want you to put something here to place the control and administration of the program in the hands of local responsible people. That's a fundamental of our government, after all, the only way to get constructive, permanent, continuing results is working through the communities, the counties, the cities, or whatever the agency is. Or if you want to go outside the official agencies, certainly into the hands of local responsible people. And that's where we've had the trouble in Mississippi with the extravagant use of automobiles day and night beyond official duty, the chartering of airplanes, or one thing I remember for $100 to go to one speaker to go to a graduation of a group of little students just uh, five years of age. If it continued, it would be effective the next year, the next calendar year. And that's exactly what happened. We pursued this matter, but all the time I told Mr. Shriver, if you get responsible people in Mississippi to take over the operation of this CDGM or any other Head Start program, I will withdraw my objection, at least until we see how it works. I did not recommend anybody. Javits uh, mentioned the fact that there are some of the matters that were discussed by you, which are very significant and I think very important to the committee, some of them consisted of the allegations in connection with this organization. And I had there before me the uh, report of Ernst and Ernst, which went into, uh, made an all part of this organization, and came out with some figures that are, are of, uh, quite different in connection with the amount of money that had been misused or the amount of money that had disappeared. And I don't know whether, Mr. Chairman, and if it meets the approval of the Senator from Mississippi, that we might at least, uh, perhaps you wouldn't want to place the whole report in the record. Well, I would put it in for suggest, record. Senator, that you uh, extract such excerpts as you would care to have placed in the record, and then we will have them printed in the record at this point of the hearing. Well, Mr. Chairman, may uh, Senator, Senator Javits? May Senator have the unanimous consent to do that, uh, culling the proper portions. That was the same report I referred to. But I think it take, uh, probably may take more than just a minute. Before. I would not anticipate that he would uh, make the excerpts now. My thought was that, unless there's objections, that the Senator from New York would be given permission to place such parts of the Ernst and Ernst report in the record as he desires to do so. You, uh, and basically, they don't find any substance to the charges and the allegations. Would the Senator yield? Well, I... Again, I, Senator, I, I have not made the study myself, so yeah. I, I just thought that, in, that, that perhaps in view of uh, the, some of the charges and in, in connection with it, 
that it would be well to have this audit.